Uh, thank you all for uh, for being with us. Um, uh, my name is Jim Minow. Uh, I think I know most of you on this call, but for those of you who um, um, who were new or who were new to me anyway, uh, welcome to the CureJM family. Um, I'm the executive director of the CureJM Foundation. I've been with the foundation for um, eight wonderful years um, as we have, I think, grown and prospered in our work to find uh, better treatments uh, and a cure for juvenile myositis. This is our 20th anniversary, believe it or not, and uh, uh, that's really quite a milestone for a nonprofit organization in a rare disease for a rare disease organization as as we are. Over these 20 years, um, and I think especially most recently, I can say in all honesty that there is no organization that has had a greater impact on myositis care and research than has CureJM. Uh, you know, Dr. Pachman spoke to a group of grandparents. Um, a few of you are on this call, um, uh, heard her in uh, our grandparent meeting last week. Um, and in speaking to that group, she was talking about the dark ages of juvenile myositis. And I'm not talking about dark ages that go back hundreds of years. She was talking about 1971 when she first started as a young doctor and uh, nothing was known about this disease. Uh, this was a pre-steroid um, era, era, if you will, um, of, of JM treatment. Uh, and she was one of the uh, uh, true visionaries uh, among the medical community at that time, um, helping move us to where we are today. Today, we know more about how to diagnose and treat JM than ever before. Um, and a lot of that knowledge, um, certainly the lion's share of that knowledge has come through research that has been funded by CureJM over this period of time. Our progress started 20 years ago uh, with co-founders uh, Tom and Sherry Hume. Uh, and they, along with uh, a, a small group of parents and grandparents, had the vision, the spirit, the dedication and the stick to itiveness to see this organization through some of its very tough times in early years um, and today to uh, one of, I think, great success and progress. So it's my true honor to introduce you um, today as we kick off um, uh, this year's holiday challenge, Giving Tuesday holiday challenge. It's my honor to introduce you to our co-founder, Tom Hume. Tom, over to you. Thanks, Jim. Um, thank you. Um, great turnout today. This is this is so exciting. This is such a great time. And I think uh, everyone, many have done talent challenges in the past. You know how invigorating they are, how much fun they can be. Um, and uh, if you haven't done one, you're going to find the same. So. Um, just really quick, a little background. So 21 years ago, um, we started our journey with uh, JM. So Parker, our son, is six years old. And like many of you, showed early symptoms. Um, but of course, at that time, we didn't know what symptoms were around JM. We actually knew very little about JM. Um, it's funny that Dr. Parkman calls the 70s the dark ages of JM research, I guess early 2000s were might have been the middle ages of JM research because still not a lot was known. Um, our particular odyssey was six months from first showing symptoms, which in hindsight, going back and looking at videos, now we would have even picked up some of these symptoms, uh, but to the doctors at the time, it took six months to figure it out. So, um, so 21 years ago, virtually very little about JM. Right? And of course, we went to the internet to find out anything we could, and that just simply scared us. Um, 21 years ago, we did not know that the best way to um, treat JM early on is one, get diagnosed early, and two, hit it aggressively with medicine. We, we had a very tapered approach, tapered on or, or ramping, with Parker, I, in hindsight, we should not have done that. Uh, should have probably hit it harder with the meds. Um, yet that 20 years ago, we didn't know the dangers of uh, sunburn and uh, how that could cause a flare. We did 20 years ago, we didn't know what calcinosis was, which Parker ended up getting. Um, and actually, he 
recovered from it, moved through it, and had a very lucky course um, with it. But still, um, that was a whole turn that we never expected. Um, and 20 years ago, we didn't know about just crossover to other autoimmune possible diseases. Um, for a while, he had ankylosing spondylitis. Um, and I think today even still battles fatigue and, and some muscle strength. Um, so that was, well, 21 years ago when he was diagnosed. 20 years ago, Sherry and I started KJM. And a lot of it was to provide answers to these things and share this kind of information with the JM community to make it easier. And um, it's funny, 20 years ago, I don't think we knew how hard it would be to start a foundation, but also we did not know how rewarding it would be um, and how, um, how much we could pay forward and how much other people would keep paying forward. And the last thing we didn't know 20 years ago was um, how much people really do want to help. And um, we would talk to friends and family. And people really wanted to do something. And they, they didn't know what to do. And we didn't really know what to tell them to do. Um, and that's where our knowledge of just fundraising kind of came about. Because, and you'll be surprised if you start asking people, how much they want to help. And even if it's a, a little bit, even if it's a small contribution, there's there's an exchange there. There's a there's a appreciation and there's a knowledge that um, um, that people feel like they're doing something for you. And that's great. And that's exactly what we expect out of this and, and hope out of this. Um, just fast forward today, Parker's 24, very healthy. He's off his uh, JM medicine, still battles again with a little bit of fatigue and muscle strength, but still doing very, very well. And again, that couldn't have happened without the research funding that we've done through the years and throughout the knowledge that we have gained as an organization and shared upon or shared with other uh, families. So uh, again, very excited to be kicking this off. I think this is gonna be a great um, 20 year anniversary. I think this will be the nice um, kickoff for the whole thing. And I'm so thankful all of you are participating because it, it, it makes a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate it very much um, though, for those heartfelt um, remarks and and um, thanks to you and 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 Sherry. We really are where we are today, and um, we're all the beneficiaries of your vision. Thank you. Uh, so, my pleasure now to uh, introduce you to a uh, a JM patient. I'm just going to share a bit of his story. Um, he's a pretty fast guy, I'm told, fast guy on wheels. So, with that, I'm going to introduce you to. Uh, Austin Kranz. Austin, over to you, please. Hi, good morning, all. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Austin Kranz, and I briefly want to share my story and to offer and send to each of your children, you know, a token of my well wishes for them. Um, I was diagnosed with JDM at the age of six. Um, I fought for about 11 years before I finally uh, hit remission, thankfully. Um, so I just wanted to join and tell you guys today that, you know, without my, without the support of my parents, without the support of Secure JM, without, you know, my friends and all my peers, you know, um, without all their support, you know, it, with all their support, it made it much, much easier uh, to help me get through like the tough times. Um, you know, my parents definitely sacrificed a lot for me, um, but you know, in the end, we persevered, and I'm very, very grateful every day for that. Um, I'm now 25 years old. Um, uh, I, I work in New York City, and um, right now I'm racing cars professionally. Um, I get to travel across the states, which is really cool, and it's something I always dreamed of doing, uh, especially at a young age. I, I always loved cars, and it's just kind of surreal that I get I'm living out my dream. Um, so. I just want to tell you to, you know, keep pushing and to tell the kids, you know, they can do their dreams. They can do whatever they set their minds to, you know, it might not be easy, but you can do it, you know, so keep pushing them, keep supporting them. Uh, 
And, you know, if times are really tough, you know, turn to your, turn to your left, turn to your right, look at your friends, look at your family, look at your peers, look at us, you know, as a sign of inspiration. So um, I just want to share that story. Um, and as a token of appreciation, uh, Shannon will uh, post a link in the chat. Um, and I'm more than willing to sign uh, photographs and putting a personal message, words of inspiration for your kids. Um, and I'd also like to offer that uh, this year I'm racing in a series called SRO. And I travel, I, there's 12 races, six states across the country. Um, so she'll also post the race schedule. So if you, your family, your kids want to come and hang out with me, hang out with the crew and experience, you know, the world of racing, you know, uh, please reach out to Shannon so that I can get the message along. I'll get you tickets and everything back passes. And I would love to spend time with the kids and, you know, show them this cool new world. So um, thank you for having me. Uh, back to you, Jim. Thank you, Austin. And, and uh yeah, share that awesome race car with that great big Cure JM logo on it with those those kids. Appreciate it very much. And uh, uh, pay attention now because uh, one of these days when you turn on your television and see a major race, you're going to see Austin going around that track in his Cure JM car. So thank you very much for all of your uh, support and helping us with, uh, with with visibility for this uh, for, for for this rare disease. Much appreciated. I first met Dr. Kave Ardalan um, at our Chicago Center of Excellence. Um, uh, Lurie Children's Hospital, as many of you know, was CureJM's first center of excellence um, going back to uh, 2013. Uh, and uh, Dr. Ardalan had, uh, had just moved there from Pittsburgh uh, to um, begin his medical journey, if you will, um, uh, as a newly minted uh, doctor, perhaps pursuing juvenile dermatomyositis as a, uh, a, as a specialty. And, and indeed, Dr. Ardalan made that, that, that switch, if you will, um, and that commitment to uh, JM and to our JM kids. He is now uh, the co-director of the uh, Cure JM Center of Excellence at Duke University, and he is a leader in numerous initiatives, clinical research, uh, for example, on emotional health, um, and he is ushering Cure JM through a process of bringing an exciting potential new steroid uh, to JM patients, steroid called Bamorolone. Uh, it's my honor to um, introduce you to the still young Dr. Kave Ardalan. Kave. Thank you so much for the warm, uh, warm introduction, Jim, and I definitely remember us uh, initially meeting. That was exciting, and it's been exciting since then. Um, I'm just going to share my screen real quick because I've got some slides just to kind of um, run through some, some uh, reflections on kind of 20 years of Cure JM and, and what that means really for those of us who are um, physicians or scientists or both who want to advance the care, uh, the quality of care for, for young people with JM. So this is, um, I think, actually kind of speaking to the, uh, the themes brought up earlier about maybe the history you could say of JM and, and where Cure JM fits into all of this. <clears throat> um, so I think, sadly, it's accurate, I think, to say what Dr. Pachman did about, you know, the 1970s and before that it was, it was really the dark ages. Um, and, um, oh, sorry, I think there's a little feedback happening. There's a way to mute. Okay, great. Yeah, so, um, so as I was saying, you know, Dr. Pachman made the comment uh, earlier about how, you know, there, there was a sort of dark ages of um, JM. Uh, and when we say dark, we really, really do mean dark. There was this thing that uh, physicians have been taught called the rule of thirds, which was that in the pre-steroid era, when there was no treatment for JM, that JDM in particular was fatal in a third of cases, permanently disabling in a third of cases. And then the remaining third were whatever that's better than that, which is unbelievable to think about. Um, and so, you know, we've been really fortunate to have visionaries like Dr. Pachman, Dr. Ryder, Dr. Reed, and others who've really uh, done pioneering work that allows us to have insight into the need for intensive treatment early on in, at the time of diagnosis for kids with JM. But even still, if you come to more recent decades, you, you really do see that we're still like, you know, if we're, if we were in the dark ages before, and then maybe the 
the 90s and early 2000s were the middle ages. You know, we're just starting to see what I hope will become in the next 20 years, like the Renaissance, you know, for us. So, um, and, and I want to just uh, highlight this, a few key dates. So we think about treatment. So uh, I was reviewing a paper um, that was published a couple of years ago by Dr. Ryder's group at the NIH. And in their paper where they were looking at medications received by JM patients, in their large group of patients, they really recognized 1997 around that time as being the pivotal point at which it seemed to become pretty standard to give methotrexate and other medicines to help you get off steroids as a routine um, you know, approach rather than that kind of step up approach that Tom was describing earlier, where maybe you start with some steroids and then you add some methotrexate and then you add a little bit of this and no way, like we needed to take a much more intensive early treatment approach. And so 1997 is around the time when at least Dr. Ryder's group was starting to, to really shift to that from what they published. Um, and other groups were doing similar things um, you know, in, in the mid to late nineties as well. But even still, it's one thing to have a set of experts who kind of get it, if you will, and, and you know, have a sense of what the most intensive and appropriate treatment approach would be. And it's a whole nother thing to say you really have clinical trials, so large studies that help us really know beyond a shadow of a doubt what the right treatments are and just how good they might be. And so in 2013, there was the publication of the rituximab and myositis study, which included both adult and pediatric patients with JDM and, and other forms of JM. Uh, excuse me, JDM and adult polymyositis, not other forms of JM. Um, and then, you know, although in 1997, people were already changing their practice, it wasn't until 2017 that a large international trial actually showed that methotrexate really is something you should start at the time of diagnosis. It will help patients get off steroids more quickly, and it has a better side effect profile than a similar medicine called cyclosporin. And then lots of us obviously know quite a bit about IVIG and how great that is for our patients, but it's literally just this year that finally in the New England Journal, there was the publication of the ProDerm study, which is an adult dermatomyositis trial that finally shows at a high level of rigor that what we kind of had a sense of before, which is that IVIG is really important treatment for patients uh, with serious and uh, intense forms of myositis. And that's an adult study, but it tracks with what we know for pediatric patients. So CureJM, you know, having been founded about 20 years ago, you can see really is at the forefront, um, you know, as a, as a foundation in trying to help us move the science forward faster. And there's some early signs here, I think, that we're, we're making some moves. But let's talk a little bit more in detail about what that means. And I, but just to be clear, I can only give sort of a partial sense of all the work that CureJM Foundation leadership, membership have, have done. So please forgive me if I can't be completely exhaustive, but just a few examples of things that have been helpful from, uh, in terms of advancing research. So one is establishing these centers of excellence, which I'll call COEs, um, initially at Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago, as well as NIH and George Washington University Hospital in uh, the DC, uh, DC area. <clears throat> and then subsequently Seattle Children's Hospital, Duke University here in North Carolina, and then most recently, University of California, San Francisco. Um, so this is really important because these are centers that are recognized for their commitment to JM and, and the quality of their care and research, but also they, they receive support from CareJM to continue to do groundbreaking research and you know, deliver high quality care. Um, but then CareJM also is pretty amazing actually as a foundation for having its own research grants program. That is not always the case for every single foundation, but CareJM actually has a application process where young scientists, some who've never even done any work in JM can get their feet wet as it were by proposing a new and novel idea and getting kind of seed funding that helps jumpstart their career. Or for those who are more senior, getting additional funding to you know, extend the work that they're doing. Um, having a dedicated line of funding for rare disease is huge. And then this is really important, the CARA registry and repository, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. So CARA is the Childhood Arthritis and Rheumatology Research Alliance. And this is a really important organization in pediatric rheumatology. Basically, it was also started about 20 years ago by pediatric rheumatologists who said, all of our diseases, including JM, are rare diseases. There is no way with a rare disease we'll ever have enough patients or enough expertise at one single hospital to sort of get the answers we need to advance care. We have to collaborate. And so CARA is an organization where every major US and Canadian hospital with pediatric rheumatologists participates and enrolls patients into the CARA registry, which is where with consent from families, um, you know, data on 
what kinds of symptoms JM patients have had, what kind of treatments they're getting, gets entered into a central database so that you can do studies that really look at hundreds rather than teens or 20s or 30s or 40s of patients. Um, that really enhances the power of the research so you can be sure that you're really detecting what's true. Um, and what's really important about CareJM's support of the care registry is that the current version of the care registry enrolls patients at the time of diagnosis. This is a huge advance because a lot of prior multi-site studies were kind of enrolling patients at any time point, and you didn't really have a lot of people that you were catching at the very beginning. And the support from CareJM is allowing CARA to assess how those patients are gonna do over many, many years. So this is really, really unique um, and impossible really without CareJM's support. Um, and then the other important thing is that what CARA is also doing is collecting blood specimens. This is what's called a repository where you bank blood specimens so that later, if you have questions about the biology of the disease, you can actually pull those and try to understand, okay, what were maybe the genes that drove someone to respond or not respond to treatment? What are the uh, molecules you can detect in the blood that help you know if someone is gonna flare? These are things that aren't possible unless you do this groundwork. Um, and we're already starting to publish. So um, Dr. Neely, Dr. Huber, Dr. Kim, who are at UCSF and also in Canada, and myself, we just um, published on basically the characteristics of the children in the, in the registry who were recruited in the first year. And that's 120 kids. So that's a huge number of newly diagnosed uh, JDM patients. So <clears throat> um, I wanted to just talk a little bit more about what it means for um, Cure Jam to be supporting, supporting us um, as a field. So the key thing is really support for early career investigators in Jam, because in pediatric rheumatology, there's what's called an hourglass shaped workforce, meaning if you look at the age distribution, there's a fairly large number of pretty senior doctors who are approaching retirement, and that includes some of our top JM experts, folks like, you know, I won't, I won't say, but like, you know, Dr. Pachman is probably the most senior in our field, and, you know, um, then you've got relatively few people in the middle of their career, and then you've got a large number of those of us like myself and, and even younger than myself who are just coming on. And there's a lot of challenges during the early part of your career if you're a physician who wants to do research. There's not a lot of time to do your research. There's not a lot of resources um, right out the gate. You need mentorship. And rare disease research is all the more difficult because there's not a lot of patients and the diseases are really complex. So just to talk through how CureJM has supported me specifically, just as an example, and um, you know, first challenge I faced right out the gate when, in 2015 was not enough time for research. 70% of my time was expected to be in the clinic and most of that was expected to be for all patients, not just JM patients. So how am I supposed to actually get started on any projects that really benefit our kids with JM? Well, CureJM, uh, my first uh, grant that I got outside of just my hospital itself was actually a CureJM grant that gave me funding to get a research coordinator who could actually help with my studies. So if I'm in clinic, she's working on things and helping get things moving. And also eventually I got salary support, meaning dedicated time to do research as part of the Chicago COE when I was there. That was huge because it allowed me to actually start writing more grants and things like that. JM is also difficult to treat and difficult to really understand disease. So you need resources and knowledge in order to actually be qualified to deliver, deliver high quality care. And so both in Chicago and at Duke, I've been in dedicated JM clinics with physical therapists available at every visit. Um, and working in COEs, both Chicago and Duke, um, with seasoned faculty allowed a young person like myself to quickly get up to speed, um, as well as to have folks to run tough cases by. And then being new to JM research. So, you know, JM, again, it's its own unique disease, it's complicated. Um, and so, as I mentioned, having my first grant come from Cure JM to study quality of life measures in JM helped me get a foot in the door as far as being considered somebody part of the JM research field. Um, in, other, in other aspects of my career, Cure JM has been super helpful. So, a lot of folks know I'm really interested in mental health outcomes for our kids with JM. And so the Cure JM Family Conference in 2018 was where, with support from Cure JM, we were able to actually do focus groups with parents of kids with JM to understand the impact on emotional health. And then we had funding to analyze the findings from those interviews. And we published that um, uh, just you know, uh, soon after, you know, within a couple of years, we were able to analyze and publish that. And it was one of the first large studies on the huge emotional health impact of JM. Um, and then Vimorolone, this could be its own whole talk, but basically this is a really exciting new, what they call dissociative steroid. And the idea is that there's changes that have been made to the molecule, the steroid mo excuse me, molecule, where the hope is that there'll be fewer side effects um, than older steroids. And this does seem to be 
panning out quite well in Duchenne muscular dystrophy patients who have received this in clinical trials, but we need dedicated studies in JM. And so um, Cure JM funded uh, effort that I could put towards uh, gathering a Duke-based team to submit a pre-IND letter to the FDA. So that's an early step where you propose to the FDA, here's how we think we could study this new drug in our patient population. What do you think, FDA? Um, and so looking back at now seven years of CareJM support that I've received, you know, I've been able to subsequently do the first JM mental health screening study, which is based at Duke, but also includes Toronto's Hospital for Sick Children and Seattle Children's. And we're presenting some of the interim findings of that at international conferences this year. Um, based on that, as well as the focus group study, I was able to get funding from the Rheumatology Research Foundation, which is the largest private funder of uh, rheumatology research in the US to do a three-year study on the impact of stress on cardiovascular health in JM as well as lupus patients. So the idea came actually from families that were telling me, we think stress impacts our kids' health. And I thought, well, we've done studies, I've, I and others have done studies showing that mental health is a huge problem, that kids with JM later in life are at high risk of heart attack and stroke. And we know from other populations that stress increases the risk of this sort of thing. So can we study that in our patients with JM? We did successfully submit that femoral loan pre-IND letter to FDA, and now we're thinking through next steps to advance that work. And just for myself, I mean, I've got a lot of expertise that has been developed over this time as a consequence of this support. And so I'm able to go to other researchers and say, here's what I can do if we collaborate and you know, build those collaborations together. Looking more broadly at our whole center at Duke and what uh, support from um, CareJM has meant for us. So Dr. DeVergston is the co-director of our center. Uh, so he and I work very closely together. His area is translational research. So really thinking about the biology of JM, what is driving this disease? How can you tell who might um, do well or not do well with their treatment based on biological markers? So he's done studies in metabolomics as well as gene expression. And then Dr. Reed is the chair actually of the whole Duke University Department of Pediatrics, which is really remarkable to think a JM expert is the boss of all pediatricians at Duke University. Um, and that is built in part on her very senior expertise in JM as one of the real pioneers in uh, basic and translational research. And she was also really kind of one of the main pediatric leads on the rituximab and myositis study. And then we're trying to educate the next wave. Um, so Dr. Covert is one of our fellows and she's actually in the lab right now doing really cool studies, um, developing these little uh, what we call microphysiological models. So basically imagine if you had muscle tissue that looks and acts the way JM muscle tissue does, but you had it on like a chip or in a plate and you could actually test treatments on it there. Maybe you could more quickly figure out what are the most promising treatments so that you more rapidly get those to trials. So she's doing this kind of work. One of our prior fellows, Dr. Stingle is the one who really worked on that gene expression study with Drs. DeVergston and Reed. And all of the pediatric and adult rheumatology fellows, even if they don't wanna become a JM expert, both pediatric and adult fellows spend time in our JM clinic so that um, you know, whether they're taking care of the kids with JM or those adults who have had juvenile onset myositis, that they have exposure. We have a dedicated JM clinic at Duke, so dedicated nurse, physical therapist, neuromuscular specialist for challenging diagnoses, close working relationships with the adult experts, as well as the muscle pathologists who read all our muscle biopsies, expertise in clinical trials through the Duke Clinical Research Institute. And we work with our partners at UNC. So Dr. DeVergston does a clinic with, um, at UNC to kind of provide our expertise there. Um, and they work with us on some of our research. We have our own registry and repository. So you could think of it as like as a, a Duke-based version of what CARA is doing. And uh, we've been collecting data and specimens for that. And that's really powered our ability to do collaborative research. We just in the past week were able to purchase a $20,000 video capillaroscopy machine, which we've been working towards getting for years. And this is able to give us really detailed assessments of the nail fold capillaries, which are those little tiny blood vessels in your cuticles that are a marker of disease activity in JM. So we're gonna get that up and running over the coming months. And in progress, Dr. DeVergston and I are trying to figure out how to build more mental health support into our clinic. So we're thinking about, could we get a dedicated social worker? Can we implement a more routine mental health screening um, program, things like that. And then beyond Duke, I mean, so, you know, I was just giving those examples because they're close at hand and kind of give you at the microscopic level, like what Cure Jam support is meant for an individual or a group. But at the community level, there's the clinical care network, which 
is really meant to go even beyond what five centers of excellence um, can provide. So really expanding access to high quality care um, in every geographic region, because we know it's hard for some families, probably most families to travel to specifically like just a few COEs. And so how can we get um, more centers to have dedicated expertise in JM um, and increase opportunities to collaborate and share knowledge. Mental health advocacy uh, that CureJM is doing, and in particular that Suzanne Edison, who's a mental health coordinator and a parent of a child with JM are doing is huge. And this again could be its own talk, but Suzanne has been just a dynamo and uh, recently worked with folks in Toronto, Colorado and uh, Duke and other program programs to do what I believe is the first, uh, what she called mosaic of mental health workshops. So these were two sessions, each two hours long uh, that uh, pediatric rheumatologists and other providers could sign on to, to get uh, detailed uh, training in mental health screening, you know, how to detect signs of depression, anxiety, goes even beyond JM actually. It really was for all of pediatric rheumatology, but I think JM is like the model off of which all of this is based. Um, there have been sessions at the ACR and other professional conferences. And I have to say, Suzanne also had a great role in organizing those. Um, and then resources for families, uh, which Suzanne I know provides and, and has like a Facebook group she moderates and way more than I could discuss here. Um, and then this is, I think my last slide, but you know, just thinking about the new generation of JM researchers. So again, we really wanna get out of the dark ages and the middle ages and go to the Renaissance, right? And that's gonna require more expertise. We can't just have a couple of experts. This disease is too complicated for any one person or one hospital to figure out. And so what blows my mind is that, you know, I've only been a board certified pediatric rheumatologist, you know, faculty uh, for seven years now. So, you know, that's not, it's not that long. And already you can see, I've just named a few, this is a partial list, but just five uh, new investigators who are either um, roughly my age or for the most part, actually younger, um, who are themselves already getting grants to do really novel work on um, different aspects of JM. And these are folks who we anticipate will be able to do collaborative work on. Imagine if we do a trial of a moral loan, for example, you're gonna need like easily 12 to 15 hospitals to participate in that. If you don't have experts at 12 to 15 hospitals, how are you gonna do this? And so right here you see, well, this expertise is starting to spread and develop and that would have been unimaginable without CareJM support, which has helped every single person who's on this slide and more. Um, so with that, I really am grateful for your time, your care, uh, everything that Tom, Sherry, Jim, Andrew, Shannon, like everybody that you guys have done, we really owe it all to you. And uh, I'll, I'll uh, send it back to you, Jim. Well, Kaveh, thank you so much for um, that extraordinary presentation. Um, not only not only was that, I think, about your story and your success, but about you know the success that that CureJM has helped foster. I'm really happy that you ended by you know by noting that there are any number of of, of younger investigators that have been supported by CureJM who are uh, are emerging as, uh, as as superstars, if you will, in this in this field as we move, uh, as you said, to the Renaissance, because we very strongly believe that is coming and coming soon. Um, it's it's now my pleasure to introduce you to uh, CureJM's Chief Scientific Officer, Dr. Andrew Heaton. Um, Andrew has a, a background in in drug development for uh, rare pediatric cancers. He joined CureJM. Uh, five years ago um, as our chief scientific officer and has been the architect and developed so much of the momentum that has moved us forward uh, during this period of time. Um, he oversees um, all of the projects that Kave was just talking about, including our centers of excellence, um, our newly minted um, clinical care network, um, if you will. And, and I think most importantly, um, has, has worked hand in glove with NIH um, and the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences um, in our drug development and drug discovery program, that being an important part of where we believe we need to go to fulfill our mission in finding uh, better treatments and ultimately a cure for juvenile myositis. Talking a little bit about how to move us into our next phase, it's my uh, pleasure and honor to introduce you to Dr. Andrew Heaton. Thanks, Jim. Hopefully I'm now off mute. 
Um, uh, it's always hard um, following Carve, um, but Carve and I have worked so closely on so many projects. Um, um, I know him as a, a fantastic um, paediatrician and somebody that's always willing to learn and ask the right questions um, of me and of the foundation. So um, I'd like to acknowledge all the work that Carve's been doing and is continuing to do. And we'll talk a little bit more about what he's doing um, during my talk. What I wanted to give you all a flavor of is um, the, as Carve said, the impact we're having um, on new treatments and a cure and the impact we're having um, on bringing up that next generation um, of, as Carve so succinctly put, the hourglass of um, the research and clinical community in JM. So um, this is a slide that I'm sure you, you've all seen before, but this really underlies what we're trying to do as a foundation and what our real mission is. And I think the thing that I really wanted to highlight that Carve highlighted as well is when you've got a rare disease, if you're trying to accelerate discovery, if you're trying to expedite uh, new treatments, and you're trying to provide access to quality care, the critical thing with a rare disease is to foster collaboration. And that's something that we've been doing um, certainly you know, for the last 20 years since, as Tom so succinctly put it, you know, when they started and didn't know anything and we were just coming out of the dark ages, you know, how do you find out about this disease? How do you actually enthuse people to do those research programs? It's always about fostering um, collaboration. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the programs that we've had going um, just in the last couple of years and what we're looking forward to um, for this year. So just starting with um, just a bit of an update, um, we can put some uh, uh, faces to some names of some of the folks that Carve just mentioned. So as far as accelerating scientific discovery, some of the grants that we gave away last year uh, we've just received some really great updates on how they're actually progressing. So um, Sarah Tansley, um, who is at the top left, she works at Bath in the UK. As Jim pointed out, you know, we're a foundation, we're the little engine that could, and we're agnostic as to where the researchers conduct their research. So for a small foundation, we really do have a global footprint. You know, we fund folks um, across the planet. So... Sarah works at Bath in the UK, and this is recognised uh, with Neil McHugh as the facility that has the best capabilities of detecting um, those myositis-specific autoantibodies. So a lot of you would have been familiar with, you know, oh, my child's gone in and, you know, they're MSA positive and they've been categorised with this MSA. As we know, so many um, of our kids that go in, they come back as MSA negative. Um, I think virtually everybody knows that there is probably an autoantibody associated with your child, but we just don't know what it is yet because it hasn't been discovered. And so one of the things that we thought was important that we fund um, Sarah and Neil to actually look at those patients that are negative and try and determine, you know, are there some other autoantibodies that we should be aware of we should generate a test for? And do they relate to a specific phenotype of the disease that might help folks like Carve um, have a specific treatment? So the great news is that Sarah has been working for 12 months. Um, they've tested numerous patients that were antibody negative, and they've actually looked like they found um, several new. So they're current several new antibodies. So they're currently working through um, the positive identification of those. So I think it's a you know, from an accelerating um, scientific discovery and looking at how we can create better treatments, um, Sarah's doing fantastic work. Um, Sarah Sabah, one of the, the younger researchers um, that, that Carve just mentioned, um, she's now up at Wisconsin. She had some time at the NIH and worked really closely with Lisa Ryder in the GW clinic, so has a great clinical background, but also with her work she did with Andy Mammon has got a great discovery background as well. So she's developed um, a mouse model. I think as everybody knows, because there are, it's so hard to get drugs to translate into JDM clinical trials, we really need to define if a new molecule or even a drug we want to repurpose 
is going to work in JDM. There are very few mouse models available for JDM because it's a rare disease. People don't develop um, these models to test these compounds. So it's great that um, Sarah has weighed in and she's developing this mouse model um, and it looks like it's been successful and we're um, about to get an update from her shortly. She's um, like Kaveh, she's um, just skipped off onto, um, in her case, maternity leave. She's just having a third child, but she'll be uh, back um, in the lab shortly. Um, and last, but certainly no means least, as far as last year's group is concerned, uh, Dr. Jane McMahon work up, works up at Sick Kids Toronto uh, with closely with Dr. Brian Feldman. And I think if anybody has met uh, Dr. Feldman and had a discussion with Dr. Feldman, you know that not only is he a great and passionate clinical researcher, he's run so many clinical trials um, and I'm sure he's, he's actually capable of having a PhD in pure mathematics. So when you have a rare disease, being able to determine a signal that actually correlates to a specific part of the disease from a very, a very low sample number is really important. So Jane and Brian have been looking at um, the samples that they've um, retained from patients up at Sig Kids, looking for an interferon signature um, as far as disease is concerned. If you've got active disease, how does the interferon signature change? When you start treatments, how does that interfere on change? When you get a flare, how does that interfere on signal change? And even though they've got relatively few samples, it already looks like they've got some really promising data um, coming out of that um, particular program. So we expect to see a publication coming out of that in the not too distant future. So that is, it's almost think of it like a companion diagnostic. So when a clinician is treating your child, how do they know when to, you know, um, start, stop? As Tom said, you know, it's like they didn't know back in 20 years ago. It's like, should we be ramping up? Should we hit it hard? You know, if we actually have a diagnostic that really can accurately determine how active the disease is and give us an idea as to how hard we should treat it, it's really important. So that's why we funded Jane and Brian up at Sick Kids in Toronto. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the, the new grantees that have um, just been awarded and you're about to see a lay summary will come out onto our website in the next day or so, or sorry, in the next week or so. Ryan, um, our new communications director, is working diligently on that. Um, but first of all, we've got um, some relatively new folks um, uh, on our grantee list this, this year um, and we've got a different sort of geographic spread. So. We've got Dr. Chuck Young Yu at Nationwide Children's. Um, and I guess Chuck's real um, field of expertise is what we call copy number um, of genes. So when you get a gene that's actually ex being expressed, how often does a cell actually produce a copy of that and produce an active protein? And he's also interested in something called complement. So complement is part of your blood system effectively that's actively involved in JDM and can attack different cells. So he's really interested in trying to determine that interface between how a gene's regulated and its copy number and specifically um, the copy number and the, of the complement um, part of uh, uh, the blood system that affects um, JM patients. Um, I think the really um, exciting thing with Chuck was um, his enthusiasm and his delight at being told that he received a research grant was the most enthusiastic I've seen anybody in my five years here. He was absolutely um, uh, so thankful that he got it, that he could continue on what he thinks is really important research. And I think importantly, all these grantees, you're going to be able to meet them all face to face. They'll all be at our family conference um, in June next year uh, in DC. Uh, Dr. Young and Han at uh, Baylor College. So I know we've got quite a few Texans um, on the line. So we've um, given a grant to an excellent group down in Texas. And what um, Dr. Han's looking at is they've got a lot of expertise in genes and gene combinations. So 
what combination of genes in patients actually gives you um, a susceptibility to JDM. Um, and I think critically, because we have a rare disease, one of the things that was really impressive with Dr. Hahn's application is while he's based in Texas, he's actually grabbing samples from um, the UK and from Europe. So he takes due cognizance of the fact that we are a rare disease and he's looking for as many samples as he can actually attain to actually test his hypothesis as to, you know, what are the genetic drivers of the disease? Because hopefully if we get at those genetic drivers, you know, we can then look at what treatments uh, we might be able to target to those specific uh, gene mutations. Um, as Carve mentioned, um, uh, Dr. Lauren Covert and Dr. Jeff Verston um, have got a really interesting um, assay system. So they're looking at, um, as Carve mentioned, these isolated muscle fibers, these myo bundles. So it, it's not like a standard Petri dish assay system. What you've got is this is somewhere between just isolated cells growing in a culture and like a mouse model that Sarah Sabah is doing. So we think it's really important that we get these assay systems that we can actually screen new drugs for. So, you know, really important work that Jeff and Lauren are doing at Duke. And last, but certainly by no means least, I think the, the really pleasing thing um, with Dr. Joanne Park's um, grant this year is um, Joanne is actually at something called uh, Nucleic Acid Accelerator Hub um, in the UK. That brings together uh, academics, it brings together industry, um, it brings together chemists and biologists, and they all sit under one roof and they all collaborate on trying to get new treatments. Joanne is what we would call an early stage um, investigator, uh, but thankfully from the funding that the foundation has given Joanne, we've managed to retain her as um, a JM researcher of the future. And I think the really exciting thing that uh, Joanne's doing at NATA is anytime DNA gets coded um, to produce a protein such as interferon, um, there's a cellular process that undergoes that coding going from a gene to produce interferon, um, which then leads to inflammation, as we know, um, in JM. What uh, Joanne and her group are looking at doing is like, even if you get that particular part of the cellular machinery that's actually producing interferon, is there a way that we can very selectively close it down? And the way that we close it down is by having what's called small interfering RNAs. Um, so what they do is they actually bind to the part of the DNA signal and stop the protein being manufactured. So we can stop the interferon, we can stop the inflammation, and this is a different way other than steroids of, of damping down inflammation. And unlike steroids, they have the real potential here to get something that is highly selective um, for um, specific signal molecules in DNA. So we're really excited, even though it's very early research, um, one of the things that we emphasised was because we're really looking at potential cures, this is something that we think is really exciting that um, is worthwhile uh, looking at in more detail. Um, <clears throat> as far as treatments um, are concerned, I wanted to acknowledge some of the work that's been going on just quickly. So Travis Kinder was our NCATS fellow, worked and developed a fantastic in vitro screen and I think the great work that Travis did is he identified um, from our existing library of drugs that are on the market, he identified several drugs that people hadn't thought of testing in JDM. And they're now working their way through the system to hopefully get to clinical trials. I think we all know that baricitinib has been in clinical trials um, before with Hannah Kim at the NIH. That trial is apparently going to be expanded. Baricitinib is currently about to enrol in a trial in JM patients in Europe. So there's a French trial that's starting up, but Travis critically identified some other drugs that we're now looking at um, coordinating with BMS to try and get Ducravacitinib um, into clinical trials for JM. So 
there's some exciting things that came from Travis's fellowship that are leading down to potential new clinical trials. And once we've actually got something that's identified from a clinical trial perspective, it's then about getting the right team together. And um, I think Carve probably undersold his um, um, influence on what he's been doing with the Moralone and really stretching what the foundation dollar can actually achieve. Um, Carve was successful in getting folks like Steve Bailvik, um, who works at DCRI and is one of the global leaders in planning clinical trials um, in rheumatological conditions, both adult and pediatric. And Carve managed to get Steve to donate his time for free. Um, so it really expanded what we could do with the foundation's money to actually try and get this memorial loan program up and running. And coordinating so many really busy people is testament to um, uh, Carve's um, skill set. Um, I think one of the adages is, you know, if you've got something that you really need somebody to act on, give it to a person that's busy like Carve because he's really good at organising his time and he's good at organising other people's time. So uh, Carve was a real asset um, to this team and we're very excited about how we can keep going with it. So thank you, Carve. Um, as Carve mentioned, you know, our, one of our new initiatives um, this year was our clinical care network, really expanding beyond our COE network, just really acknowledging the breadth of the paediatric rheumatology um, clinical expertise, not just in the US, but critically, you know, outside the US with Great Ormond Street Hospital in the UK, you know, but really just emphasises the geographic spread that the foundation has and importantly, the collaborators that we've got in these different um, hospitals. So I'm not going to go through them individually, but you can see, you know, our spread is um, quite significant. Um, last but not least, our COEs that Carve um, also mentioned. So I won't labour the point as to how important it is to fund our COEs. And then just to finish off, um, I think, you know, the 20th anniversary year, is going to be a really significant year for the foundation. Um, uh, I know it's going to be really significant. Um, expect some really big announcements in the next um, month or so. There's some really exciting things happening with some of our research groups in JM, which we're extremely proud of. Um, I think as Carve mentioned, we've had a swathe of new initiatives courtesy of Suzanne um, in mental health, um, including some awards uh, we've been um, giving Mason's Miracle Awards to some of our clinical care networks. I think next year is going to be our biggest grant um, year. Uh, we're also looking at giving um, a fellowship award out so that we can ensure we retain some paediatric rheumatologists. We've got our first in-person family conference um, in June. We're probably going to have our um, annual symposium there as well so we can have a hybrid in-person and... Um, virtual conference so we can still attract our global um, audience so um, 2023 is going to be a really exciting um, year um, and I think you know I, it goes without saying that I have to thank uh, Dr Ryder and our hard-working medical advisory board to the clinicians and researchers such as Carve uh, that work so closely and passionately with our patients on a day-to-day -day basis um, our CureJM Board of Directors, which includes obviously folks like uh, Tom and Shari as founders of the foundation, to all the volunteers that work um, uh, with the foundation and put in so much time and effort to really get us the footprint that we've got. And last but certainly not least, the reason we're here, um, the patients and families. So happy to take any questions. Great. Well, we do have a few on text if there's um, if there's no one that wants to jump in. Um, Dr. Ardalan, I think this is one for you. And um, I have to admit, as a parent, these are some of the terms that are confusing to all of us. So maybe you could help us out a little bit. Um, we've got a couple questions. Could you explain what doctors mean when they talk about a second line treatment? and a biologic. Is this the same thing? Are they different? Um, can you help the families understand what that might mean? Yeah, happy to do so. So 
Um, first line, second line, third line, this is um, kind of medical jargon, but basically um, when, you're, you know, when you're teaching a doctor how to take care of patients with a condition like JM, there is usually standard treatments that are given initially that really you would think of as like the kind of the, the usual care that anyone should get right out the gate. And so a you know, good example of that would be, of course, steroids for any autoimmune disease, including JM. And then for most patients with JM, methotrexate would be the, the other medication that's given alongside um, steroids. Some patients will get more than that, in, you know, but the first line treatment for uh, JM is typically considered steroids and methotrexate at the minimum. Second line is what you say, what, what you refer to when a treatment is given either because a patient has uniquely severe disease or their disease just isn't responding completely to first line. So an example you know, of severe disease would be a patient who is so weak, they can't swallow, they can't eat safely. That's a patient who we know just giving methotrexate and, met and uh, steroids, that's not gonna be enough for them. We should be giving IVIG. We should probably be giving potentially more than that. You know, So those would be patients who immediately start some second line treatments on or, you know, a patient who started out on steroids and methotrexate and three months in, you see, uh, oh, they're just not really responding or they're even getting worse. You add second line treatments. And so that could include things like IVIG and so on. Biologic is, a, is just a, a general term for a type of medication that it, it's really a medical term for medications that are basically large molecules that are um, derived in some way from, you know, biological materials. So an example of that would be what are called monoclonal antibodies. These are um, treatments that are given usually through an IV or as an injection that target like specific molecules that drive diseases like JM. Um, rituximab is an example of a biologic, for example. So biolog not, most biologics are considered second or third line in JM, um, but the terms aren't exactly the same. That's great. I think that's really helpful. Um, that gave everyone a little bit of time to unmute. So if anyone jumps in, otherwise we have some more on text. I think people are oftentimes in their car, so they may be on mute. Um, we have one more, Dr. Ardelman. I think this might also be for you. Could you explain why JDM causes calcinosis? And then what are the treatments that, are there such thing as second line treatments or third line treatments um, if the child is still kind of battling that? Yeah, that is a great question. So calcinosis is probably one of the most mysterious aspects of JDM. I, um, we really as a field still don't fully understand why it happens, why it's only some kids that get it. We do know that certain um, patients seem to be at higher risk. For example, those who have what are called NXP2 antibodies or the other name for that antibody is MJ antibody. So that's one known risk factor for developing calcinosis. We also seem to see calcinosis more often in patients who develop JDM at a younger age. So it's not a, it's not a law or anything, but you know, on average, I'd be more worried about a patient who first got JDM at age three versus, you know, I would be more worried about that patient eventually getting calcinosis than one who got it at age 17, though both could certainly get it. Um, and interestingly, JDM patients develop calcinosis more frequently than adult dermatomyositis patients. And we don't really understand why that is either. So I think this, the sort of simple way of thinking about it though, is that we know that calcinosis, um, when it's first developing, if you were, I, I don't recommend this, and this is not something you do in clinic, but in research studies where they were able to kind of study some calcinosis, they actually um, notice that when calcinosis is first forming, it's often kind of semi-liquid or kind of pasty before it turns hard like a rock. And so there were some people who did studies where they actually drained some of that liquid out and sent it for analysis, and they saw tons of inflammation in there. So it does seem like somehow initially the immune system is attacking the skin and soft tissue underneath it. But for reasons we don't understand, somehow then that attracts um, cells that deposit calcium in that location. And it explains why um, at, for some patients, intensifying their JM treatment might help their calcinosis. Um, so that's something that we first look at is if somebody's developing calcinosis, do they still have active JM? And if so, first try to just control the JM itself and then see if the calcinosis responds to that before thinking about other treatments. Um, and okay. then in terms of treatments, like that's, 
there are definitely treatments to try, but no one knows like what the perfect treatment for um, calcinosis is. So that is something that can feel a little bit, I don't wanna say trial and error, but it really is something where there are a couple different approaches and you have to sort of see what fits best for your patient. Yeah, I, I think that people struggle with that one. Um, one more from the chat. Um, can you explain why the muscles would have recovered, but not the skin? Why the skin sometimes feels to a lot of families like it's really hard to treat? Yeah, that is also something that we see. So it, it's um, something the families, I think, have, as always, families know things before the doctors and scientists do. Um, and so, um, and but in fact, we also see that both in our you know, clinics and then there have been a couple of publications that show when you follow patients with JM, their muscle disease typically is pretty responsive to the currently available treatments. If this were just a disease of muscle and it responded this way, most patients would, would basically seem to get into remission eventually. The skin though is very stubborn in JM and we don't fully understand that right now. Like what, what is different about the skin and what's going on with the immune system's interaction with the skin that makes it so much harder to treat. There are research, a number of researchers, like um, there's an adult researcher, Dr. Vicki Wirth, who does adult dermatomyositis research, and she's a dermatologist. So she just studies the skin part of this disease. Um, and then, you know, in pediatrics, there's a lot of folks interested in this. One great example would be uh, Dr. Turnier in Michigan. That's actually kind of one of her main areas of focus is the skin part of JM. Um, as far as the appropriate treatments, again, it depends on the patient. So it's hard to give like a, a generic answer, but um, IVIG is always a really good first choice um, to add on if, if a patient's not already on it and has refractory skin disease, so. Yeah, great. Um, and you, you may have seen this one in the chat, but uh, Manahi um, had a really good question. She saw a study on low resistance training with partial blood flow resistance. I have not heard of that. Have you heard of that? What is? Um... Yeah, I, I'd have to go back and see um, that specific article because I haven't looked at the, the physical, um, uh, physical therapy literature as, uh, so recently. So um, I feel like I remember this paper, so, but I, I should be cautious because I don't have it at my fingertips. Yeah. I'll say though, I think that that's kind of investigational right now. I don't I'm not aware of like common use of this like partial blood flow resistance and I'm not, okay, I'm Mana, not too familiar. We yeah. can follow up with um, the rest of our uh, medical advisory board too and, and loop back with you. Um, one more, and I apologize if I, um, if I butcher this one, but could you explain why JDM causes lipodystrophy and what, what someone might ask their doctor if that's something they're dealing with? Yeah, this is another one where we don't, I mean, it's actually lipodystrophy in general is very poorly understood. So, you know, another really different disease population that gets lipodystrophy is HIV patients. I mean, you know, so that's, that's obviously a completely different realm and yet lipodystrophy is an issue there. There are also some genetic syndromes that can cause lipodystrophy among the multiple symptoms, but in, in most of these diseases, it's not really that well understood, like what's driving it. Um, <clears throat> what we do know though, is that similar to calcinosis, lipodystrophy tends to be associated with, um, delay to treatment. So patients who didn't get diagnosed quickly or didn't get, you know, intensive enough treatment are at higher risk of developing lipodystrophy and calcinosis. Um, there is an association between TIF1 gamma antibodies and lipodystrophy. So, and the other name for that antibody is P155-140 antibody. Um, so not all patients are at the same risk of lipodystrophy. Um, I think with regards to lipodystrophy, there's also different degrees of severity of lipodystrophy. So some patients can have what's called partial lipodystrophy, which is where you just have, well, let me back up because some people may never have heard this term lipodystrophy. So lipodystrophy is just a medical term for when uh, basically fatty tissue underneath your skin just starts to disappear. So you end up kind of having this very, very um, almost like thin arms and legs appearance or kind of gaunt appearance. Um, so that can be partial. It can just happen like maybe in your arms or part of your legs. It can be, or it can be more generalized where people have like loss of the fat in the face, the trunk and the arms and legs, um, which even can be kind of disfiguring if it's really intense. Um, so to give an example, like I have a patient who has had it. And if you compare like the buttocks and thigh on one side to the other, they have like one leg that's just thinner than the other because they lost the fat in that part of that leg. 
the big the biggest thing to know about lipodystrophy besides the fact that if it's present it suggests that maybe someone has more severe jdm and might need to be treated more intensively is um it's also highly associated with something that i'm also interested in which is um risk factors for cardiovascular disease so there are a number of studies that show that like between 25 and 50 percent of lipodystrophy patients with jdm um, have like high triglycerides which is a type of fat similar to cholesterol uh, high cholesterol levels, um, higher risk of diabetes. And you can imagine if they're getting steroids on top of it, which also can, you know, produce high cholesterol levels and risk of diabetes, it's kind of a perfect storm from a heart health standpoint. So any patient with lipodystrophy, they should also be having regular screening for um, prediabetes and high cholesterol levels because they may be at higher risk of those issues, even in childhood. And then their JDM needs to be treated intensively to hurry up and get it under control. Sometimes if it's not such bad lipodystrophy, I have seen the fat kind of fill back out. Other times mm. it's just gone and it stays that way. Yeah. Well, one last question in the chat um, from Diana. She is taking baricitinib mm -hmm. and wondering what your thoughts are on that or anyone else's thoughts. Andrew may have thoughts. Um, great medication. So, uh, we, I don't, I don't personally have a patient on baricitinib, but I've got, um, I've got some experience using tofacitinib, which is also a JAK inhibitor. It works similarly, slightly differently. Each of these JAK inhibitors works a little differently. Um, and truth be told, the reason my patients are on tofacitinib and not baricitinib is, is because it's really hard to get insurance approval for these medicines. And tofacitinib has been around a little longer and it's just oftentimes easier to get. Although I think that's changing as like we get more data on baricitinib and can prove to insurance that this is really good treatment for our kids with JM. Um, but usually um, these types of medicines called JAK inhibitors, like baricitinib, tofacitinib, these are usually reserved for certain scenarios like patients with really, really refractory disease, especially really refractory skin disease, patients who have severe vasculopathy. So that's where the um, inflammation and changes of the small blood vessels are causing serious problems for the patient. Um, that often goes along with bad skin disease. And then um, there are some patients with uh, JDM who develop severe lung disease. And there's some thought that, you know, medications like JAK inhibitors might be helpful for that type of um, population. So um, yeah, I mean, I think they're really exciting medications uh, because they do seem to help a variety of patients who, um, who have refractory JDM or particular manifestations that are hard to treat with JDM. It's great. Well, hopefully uh, you're doing well with it, Diana, and, and liking the way that it's, it's working. Um, that is all we have from the people that are stuck in a, in a car or at work and, and can't talk, but I don't know. Um, perhaps anyone wants to unmute and, and see what else we can stump Dr. Ardalan with all of, uh, all of these great questions. Um, and of course, we can follow up um, afterwards as well. Shoot me a question and we can we can get Dr. Ardalan or um, an Andrew or another member of our medical advisory board to uh, to jump in. Um, mm. And I do want to let you know, Austin, we have a couple of responses already to um, Austin's very generous request to send your your jammers some of his professional race car um, posters signed with encouraging messages, although I will warn you all that my kids really liked that video of Austin crashing into the wall at 80 miles an hour. So uh, if they're learning to drive, maybe uh, let them know Austin's a professional and they they, they should enjoy watching him on TV only. <laughs> but um, no, that was a really great video. And if, if you click the survey link, you can see Austin racing, which is pretty cool. Um, so any, any other questions for Dr. Ardalan or, or Dr. Heaton um, or Tom or Jim while we've got everyone? I had a quick question. Great. Um, I was just wondering, how long would you wait into remission before testing weaning off medications? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. So um, that's a really, really great question. So there is not, there's not a, um, like internationally agreed upon standard for this, but one thing that uh, has shown up in some um, international guidelines for the care of patients with JM is that you, you definitely want to try to achieve remission on medications first. And the first order of business then should be to 
get off of steroids. So if there's going to be a medication to prioritize getting off of, of course, it's going to be those because they have the most side effects. Once you're off of those treatments, um, there's a consensus guideline um, called the SHARE guideline that um, suggests that you should just keep everything else the same for about a year and see if that remission is durable for that year off steroids before choosing one medication to then start weaning off of. Some people, I will say, some people will start weaning IVIG a little sooner than that. And that's a practice that depending on the patient's situation I've, I've done and others have done. But aside from that particular exception, like in general, you wanna see if there's durable steroid-free remission for at least one year. And for some severe patients, maybe you might wanna wait longer um, before testing the waters with slowly tapering off treatments. It's, it's a, if you look at studies of how long it takes patients to get off all of their JM meds, uh, who successfully get off and stay in remission off their meds, it's a years long process. So it's you know in the neighborhood of like four or five, six years to really get from diagnosis to remission on meds to slowly getting off. And that's an average. So I think Austin shared earlier that remission came about 11 years into diagnosis, if I heard right. So you know it really speaks to how, um, you know, how long it does take sometimes to really get to the place we want to be at for our patients. Yeah, just to, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, just to add on, yeah, it took uh, probably about two full years before I was like officially on a remission. Um, I was seeing Dr. Pachman at what was then Children's Memorial Hospital. Um, and uh, it was a slow process off the medication. It wasn't anything that was just like, all right, yes, you're on remission. It was more of a longer process. Um, but yeah, like uh, he was saying, it's slow and gradual getting off medication and then seeing if it's sustainable, which luckily for me, it was. Thank you. That's great. One, one more call. I know we've gone a little over, but... Um, time has just flown with this great information. So thank you guys all for sticking with us for a few extra minutes. Um, and again, if you think of something, you know, later in the day, just reach out and we'll get we'll get it over to Dr. Ardalan and Dr. Heaton and, and get you back a really good response. Um, looks like we have one more. Um, well, it looks like the chat is is out of questions. Dr. Ardalan, you've done it. You've uh, you've answered all of our questions, uh, at, at least for this time being. So um, I guess over to you, Jim, if you have any closing remarks. Uh, just a few. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Austin, Tom, uh, Kabe, and, and Andrew. Um, thanks to all of you. Um, I, there's, there's two other individuals I want to uh, just briefly call out for a moment. Um, and one of them, uh, I think both Andrew and Kabe spoke briefly about our clinical care network. And I, uh, I just wanna mention that, um, uh, that we are able to also support the development of newer programs in our JM programs in our clinical care network. Um, and one of the ways we're able to do that is this year we made our first Mason's Miracle Awards uh, to, uh, uh, to, to several of those clinical care network members. We hope to make more of them in the future. We will make more of them in the future. Um, and, and I wanna thank um, uh, uh, Damon Smedley and the Smedley family for, uh, for really moving this Mason's Miracle uh, program forward and, and, and helping us raise the money to, to bring these new clinics uh, online with, with uh, uh, with, with, with younger, enthusiastic JMS experts coming up through the, through the ranks. I, I also want to thank uh, Marge Coffee and the entire Coffee family for the, for the Coffee Family Challenge, uh, which, as you all know, uh, matches gift for the Holiday Challenge. And I want to thank all of you. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for, uh, for your family support, uh, for your dedication to uh, everything that we've been trying to achieve for uh, the past 20 years, as well as uh, um, into the immediate future. Uh, the holiday challenge is uh, coming up. Um, our big day is on Giving Tuesday, November 29th. I want to thank all of you for your, um, for your dedication and your teamwork and your outreach um, to help us meet this goal of $750,000 um, this year for the holiday challenge. It's our largest fundraising program um, in any given year. 
uh, and CureJM families have indeed made that happen over and over again uh, through the years, making all of this progress possible. So um, my sincere thanks to, uh, to all of you for, uh, for your dedication, for your commitment, and, and I, I, I wish you all a, a, a wonderful Thanksgiving and holiday season as we, as we move towards the end of this year and off to a, um, a bright new future. So thank you for being with us.